Good day, grade 11. Welcome to this next lesson on physical science. Today we're going to continue with universal law of gravity. We actually just got one more question that I really want to do with you guys. And then we're moving on to the atomic model. Yay! So welcome if this is your first lesson with us. If not, welcome as well. Um, and let's get started immediately. So we were started doing this question um, last week where I'd amended the question and I decided that it looked quite messy and also it's quite hard to come back from, let's see, we did it on Thursday, so it'll be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, half of Tuesday, it's five days. It's quite difficult to come back to a question after five days and see what you were doing. So I thought let's just start it again because it's a very cool question. It has been in the exams. I've seen it um, in both the common papers for the grade 11s and the grade 12s. So let's do it. OK, it says you have a spaceship which has a mass of 315, oh, let's try again, 31,500 kilograms. And it's some distance between the Earth and the moon. OK, so we've got the Earth and we have the moon and we have some random spaceship okay random spaceship dee, 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 dee. sorry okay <laughs> some distance from between the earth and the moon it says find the distance the spaceship is from the earth if the net gravitational force of attraction exerted on the ship is zero so if net equals zero so what is that saying it's saying the force of the Earth on the spaceship plus the force of the moon in the spaceship have to equal zero, okay, because it's the sum of the forces. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to say, it says, first it says find the distance the spaceship is from the Earth. So we're going to do let the distance the Earth the spaceship is from the Earth be x, okay, do you agree with that? That's x. Okay, we're assuming the spaceship is terribly small, so we're just going to go all the way to there. Okay, now um, it says the Earth moon distance is 3,84 times by 10 to the 8 meters. So you do from here to there is going to be 3,84 times by 10 to the 8 minus x meters. If this is x and the whole of this is 3.84 times 10 to the 8, do you agree that this is 3.84 times by 10 to the 8 minus x? Okay. Now it says. We know that these masses, okay, this force and this force have to be added up to equal zero. So let's do that. Let's find out these forces. So the force of the Earth on the spaceship, okay, is going to be big G, mass of the Earth, mass of the spaceship over the R squared. Okay, that's the formula. So G remains G. Okay, let's just leave that like that at the moment. The mass of the Earth, they tell us, is 5.98 times by 10 to the 24. They tell us the mass of the spaceship. It is 31,500 all over this distance here, which is x plus the radius of the Earth. Okay, and the radius of the Earth is 6.38 times by 10 to the 6. Okay, so it's going to be... 6 comma 38 times by 10 to the 6 plus x all squared okay do not panic just yet okay so that is the force of the earth on space or vice versa the force between the earth and space now let's do the force between the spaceship and the moon okay the force of this moon on the spaceship or the spaceship on the moon, same thing. It's G, right? But this time it's mass of the moon, mass of the spaceship over R squared again. So we leave G, okay? What is the mass of the moon? The mass of the moon, they tell us, is 7.36 times by 10 to the 22. The mass of the spaceship remains to be 31,500 all over now that's the radius of the moon plus this all squared so the moon radius is 1.74 times by 10 to the 6 plus this bit here which is 3.84 times by 10 to the 8 minus x all squared okay now if these two add up to zero, do you agree that means that I can say that if 
Earth to spaceship equals minus F moon to the spaceship. Okay, if I take that across. So I can use these to equate them and work out what X is. So let's do that. So I've got G times by 5.98 times 10 to the 24 times by 31,500 all over this horrible thing, 6.38 times by 10 to the 6 plus x all squared is equal to, here we go, g 7.36 times by 10 to the 22, I don't know what happened to the 2 nor there, plus times by 31,500 all over and I'm going to add these quickly, these two numbers quickly on the calculator just to get an overall number. So let's do that. So we're going 1.74 exponent 6 plus 3.84 exponent 8 equals. Sure. Okay, now remember what I said to you, you can actually change your mode or your setup, you go shift mode, yeah, and you choose seven for science and then you choose three for three um, significant figures or two decimal places and you get 3.86 times by 10 to the 8, okay. So we're going to do that, 3,86 times by 10 to the 8 minus x all squared. Okay, now initially you'd think, okay, now what are we going to do? We're going to solve all the x's and everything. Yes, we are. But if you look at this carefully, do you see that this g is equal to that g? Okay. And this 31,500 is equal to that 31,500. So already the sum is looking a little bit easier. Do you agree? We've got, we've got this thing here, which has got not got an x in it, and you've got this thing here, which is not going to x in it. Okay. So do you agree it's looking a lot easier? Okay, now there is a trick to this. I'm going to show you the trick. We're going to cross multiply. We're going to take that there and go there. Okay, so let's do that. So if we do that, um, we're going to end up with 3,68 times by 10 to the 8 minus x all squared all over 6.38 times by 10 to the 6 plus x all squared, okay, equals, equals 7 comma 3, 6 times by 10 to the 22, all over 5 comma 9, 8 times by 10 to the 24, okay. So now, what do we need to do? We need to put this in the calculator, and then we need to fix things. So let's do that. So let's put that in the calculator. Okay, so let's move this over and get out of it on and do a fraction. And you've got 7.36 exponent 22 all over 5.98 exponent 24 equals. So that becomes 1.23 times by 10 to the minus 2. That is equal to 1.23 times by 10 to the minus 2. Okay, and at this point in time, I'm actually going to erase, not all, I'm going to erase all of this bit here so that I've got space to work. Okay, and remember grade 11s, if you've missed anything in these lessons or if for some reason you've missed part of the lesson or you came in late or whatever, you can go watch your recording of the lesson. Hey, the only difference between, whoopsie, what am I doing? No, it's fine. The only difference between the recording and a non and the live thing is that during the live thing, if you're logged in, you can message me. Whereas in the recording, you can't message me because obviously it is a recording, okay? There's nobody on the other side. So, yeah. So, Otherwise, it's exactly the same and it's very useful. So feel free to go check out the recording. You get to it in exactly the same way you get to the live lesson. Okay, so now let us go back. So do you agree? And I'm just going to summarize what we've got so far. We've got 3 comma 6 8 times by 10 to the 8 minus x all squared all over 
six comma three eight times by ten to the six plus x all squared is equal to one comma two three times by ten to the negative two. Okay, now you know what I'm tempted to do. I'm tempted to multiply this out, then you square both brackets and you end up with this huge thing, okay? But I've suddenly realized that both of these are squared. So if I take into consideration that if I square root them, this becomes a plus or a minus, and then I can solve for it, and it'll be a much easier question to solve if I do that. So that's actually what I'm going to do. I'm going to square root both sides. But remember when you square both sides, what can you do? You go plus and minus both of this, okay? So this becomes 3 comma 6, 8 times by 10 to the 8 minus x all over 6.38 times by 10 to the 6 plus x equals, and it's the square root of this. So we're going to go square root answer, answer equals. And that's 1.11 times by 10 to the minus 1. So it's either plus 1.11 times by 10 to the minus 1 or minus 1.11 times by 10 to the minus 1. Okay, either of those two. So now we unfortunately have to do both those sums. But trust me, this is still a lot quicker and easier than if we multiply multiplied out the brackets with these squares with these horrible numbers and then try to factorize it. It would have been a really long sum. I would think nightmare, but I'm supposed to be positive, so it would have been a very long sum. Okay, so let's carry on. So your options are 3 comma 6 8 times by 10 to the 8 minus x is equal to 1 comma 1 1 times by 10 to the negative 1 multiplied by 6.38 times by 10 to the 6 plus x or it is 3 comma 6 8 times by 10 to the negative 8 minus x is equal to minus 1 comma 1 1 times by 10 to the negative 1 times by 6.38 times by 10 to the 6 plus x. Sure. Okay, so this stays the same. It's 3 comma 6, 8 times by 10 to the 8 minus x is equal to, and I need to multiply those. So let's do that. So I'm taking the 1.11 times by 10 to the minus 1 and I'm multiplying it by 6.38. 6.38 getting there. Um, sorry, I was thinking about the sum, to be honest. Equals 7.08 times 10 to the 5. 7.08. 7.08 times by 10 to the 5. Plus 1, 1, 1 times by 10 to the negative 1. Okay. Plus 1, um, sorry, x, 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 x. Okay, right. So do you agree? I'm just going to carry this on through then. This becomes a little bit easier then because now we've got 3 comma 6 8 times by 10 to the 8 minus 7.08 times by 10 to the 5 is equal to 1 comma 1 1 times by 10 to the 1 plus 1. So you take the cross plus 1. X. Okay, so therefore we've got 2 comma 1 1 times, but actually it's not necessarily. Um, is this minus 1? Yeah, I thought I screwed up. Okay, right, so let me just fix that. That's okay. 1.11 1. 1 times by 10 to the negative 1. Okay, so let's pop this in our calculators again. So we end up with 7.085 times by 10 to the negative 5, okay? Now we're going to minus 3.68 exponent 8. And I know this is minus, but that's because I did it backwards. So this is positive 3.67 times by 10 to the 8. So it becomes 3,67 times by 10 to the 8 is equal to, and yeah, we've got this number here, 1 point, hmm, 1 point 1 1 exponent negative 1 plus 1 equals 1 point 1 1 x, okay, 1 comma 1 1 x, and then we do this, 
and then we go 3.67 exponent 8 divided by 1.11 equals 3.31 times by 10 to the 8. 3.31 times by 10 to the 8. So we can 3 comma 31 times by 10 to the 8 meters equals x. Okay. Or, and what you're going to end up here with is a negative answer. So that's not going to work. If you've got a positive answer here, you're going to end up with a negative answer here. So you can ignore it. So there you go. That is your answer. Sure. Long sum. Okay, I'm just going to very briefly tell you what would have happened if we did it a different way. And I'm going to show you very, very briefly. I'm not actually going to go all the way into it. I just want to show you why I decided to square root both sides up there instead of doing the traditional multiply across. And then you'll understand why I did it. Okay, and why I say this is the easier version of the two. I must admit that the usual version of this question doesn't have the radii of the moon and the earth. So all you have to work out is x and I don't know, the distance minus x squared. You don't have to add in the radius of the earth and the radius of the moon every time. But since this question did have the radius of the moon and the earth in, I just Decided to work with like that. Okay, so let's pretend you were at this point here, and you just didn't you didn't decide to square root. Okay, let's say you decided not to square root. What are you going to do? You're going to end up multiplying this thing onto that side, right? So you end up with three comma six eight times by ten to the eight minus x all squared is equal to 1 comma 2 3 times by 10 to the negative 2 multiplied by 6.38 times by 10 to the 6 plus x all squared and then what happens is you actually have to square out these brackets so it becomes 3 comma 6 8 times by 10 to the 8 all squared minus 2 times 3.68 times by 10 to the 8 okay x plus x squared okay is equal to we've got one comma two three times by ten to the negative two and then you've got six point three eight times by ten to the six all squared plus two times by six point three eight times by ten to the six <sighs> x x plus x squared okay and then you multiply it out and you end up with a trinomial. You end up with an x squared with something in front of it, an x. And then you have to use the formula and so on and so on. So do you see why I didn't use this? Why I decided to square it both sides and go for it? Okay, so but either way you do it, you should get it out because it is mathematically correct. But there you go. That I think is the most difficult example of um, a gravitational force question. Okay, let's move to the atomic model. Okay, let's do some chemistry. So before we discuss the model of bonding, we need to remember it is based on the model of the atom. Okay, and you must remember the model, the definition of a model in science is that it is a representation of what is happening in reality. In other words, it's how we are trying to describe and explain what's actually really happening, okay? So let's talk about the model of the atom, and we're talking about today's today's understanding of the model of the atom, okay? And admittedly, also what you need to remember is that this is a simplistic version of our model. It's very simplistic compared to what you might see when you go to university and you do some physics and chemistry, and they start talking about quarks and colors and flavors and all sorts of things, and you go, what? Okay, but as far as you guys are concerned, it has a central nucleus and inside that nucleus there are protons and neutrons and the protons and neutrons have got exactly the same mass exactly the same mass so that's why they're drawn the same size okay they've got the same mass and all the mass of the atom comes from that nucleus okay why because there are little these teeny electrons that are approximately 2000 times smaller okay, then the protons and neutrons in size, okay, so they really are teeny, 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 but they've got the same size charge as a positive proton, I mean, as a positive, yeah, positive proton, so if, in other words, electrons charge is 1, 6 times by 10 to the next, 
19 coulombs. A proton's charge is 1,6 times by 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And a neutral thing doesn't, or the neutron does not have any charge, okay? It's there really just to add mass. Okay, at the moment, that's all you need to know. It's surrounded by electrons in fixed energy levels, okay? And these levels are called shells. Okay, so what you need to understand is that this here, for example, would be one energy level or shell, okay? So it's, it's what happens is, and the reason I'm coloring it like this is because the orbitals are basically areas where you're most likely to find electrons, okay? Let's just remind you of that, okay? Orbitals are where you are most likely to find electrons, okay? That's the general definition of an orbital, is that it's, orbitals are where you're most likely, an area in space around a nucleus where you are most likely to find electrons, okay? Now, orbitals are within energy levels or any shells, okay? So what happens is there's an energy level here which has got two electrons, and I don't know if you can see, I've kind of inked over the one electron. So there's two electrons here, okay? Then there's a big space, a quite a big space between the first energy level and the second energy level. And the second energy level is made up of um, one, S, uh, one S orbital, Okay, and then it's six p orbitals. Okay, six p orbitals. Okay, so what are we saying? We're saying that we got electrons are moving in orbitals. They're moving in these areas around the nucleus. Okay, and then we can say, well, this year we can consider it an energy level, but we can also consider it an orbital because an energy level just describes how many orbitals there are in a certain gap, whereas the orbitals describe how the atoms move around the nucleus, okay? Right, so now electrons in the outer energy level are called valence electrons. Electrons in the outer energy level are called valence electrons, and I think we've spoken about valency and valence electrons and the difference. So remember that valency is how many bonds an atom can make, okay? It's the amount of bonds. Whereas valence electrons is the number of free electrons that are available to bond, okay? And they can be different because you could have oxygen, for example, which is in group six. So oxygen in group six will have six valence electrons. That's how many electrons there are in the outer energy level. Okay, six valence electrons. But because it's the way it's situated in group six, it's got a valency of two. It means that it has space for two more electrons to join it before it has the configuration of a noble gas. Okay, so valence electrons are involved in the bonding. So let's talk about the periodic table and valence electrons. We've just been touching on that now. So remember that valence electrons effectively the number of electrons you have in your outer energy level, right? And therefore, it is given by the group number, by the group number. So in other words, the way that this periodic table is numbered, okay, if you're not doing the old-fashioned Roman thing that goes one, two, three, four, five, six, six, all the way through, okay? If you're doing what we do in science in school, you go one, two, skip a few, three, four, five, six, that's six. Oh, oh, oh shit, I can't try again, sorry. One, two, three, uh, one, two, skip a few, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, so that there is how it works, okay? So what we're saying in group one, it's got one valence electron, group two has got two valence electrons, in three it's got three, four, four, five, da, 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 all the way through. Now these things here are called the transition metals, transition metals. Okay, in other words, they have got the ability to have different number of electrons in their valence or their outer electron shell, excluding silver. 
silver is always AD plus. In other words, it's always lacking one electron. It needs space for it. Has space for one electron. Okay, these transition metals, the rest of them, they can flip between having a valence of one or, I mean, a valency of two or three or whatever. So therefore, we call these as transmission metals and they change, okay? These, however, tell you the number of valence electrons that they have. And the way it works, the bonding is that this is, if you're looking at bonding, however, this is just the number of electrons. If you're looking at bonding, it is one, two, three, Four, three, two, one, and obviously zero. So, what are we saying by that? We're saying that then if you look at fluorine, fluorine's in group seven, right? If you look at fluorine. So, what are we saying? We're saying that fluorine is in group seven. It's got seven valence electrons. Seven. So, an outer shell has got eight electrons to be noble or noble like again to be neutral so if i have seven electrons i have to get one more electron just one more electron to be kept to be acted so that i can act as a oh, sorry so that i can get to be a noble noble thing okay so i've got seven electrons so what am i going to do i'm going to gain one and that's what one means that's one this here tells you how many electrons and this is your valency and this is your valence electrons, your valency and your valence electrons. Okay, so now, electrons always try to occupy the lowest possible energy level. Noble gases are full valence electrons, they do not bond. Atoms for bonds achieve full electron atoms. So let's talk about bonding. Okay, if you have, for example, two hydrogen atoms and they're approaching each other, so what do we know? We know that there is a proton and neutron nucleus and we know that there's one electron that is floating in the outer energy level or orbital okay ditto with this one ditto with this one so what happens is that when this atom comes into close contact with this atom because there's this outer shell that can carries electrons and there's an outer shell that carries electrons the electrons on the separate atoms repel each other they've got a repulsive force okay but then at the same time remember what i said to you about atoms i don't know if i did say this to you so let me tell you atoms are mainly made up of space okay so remember that if this is a hydrogen atom there's one proton in the middle okay it's really big but there's one proton okay and then it's got an electron which orbits the whole time the whole time there's one electrons orbiting okay so there's going to be a time when this electron over here is seeing that proton over there because this electron is over here okay so when that happens there is an attractive force between the nucleus of the one atom and the electron on the other okay now obviously it's easiest to explain this using hydrogen because we've got one whereas when you're explaining using i don't know boron or carbon and you've got four groups and whatever whatever then it gets a little bit more complicated but it works on the same principle okay and then finally there's a repulsive force between the two positive charged nuclei if this electron i mean this yeah electron keeps moving that way and this electron keeps moving this way there might be a time when this electron remember 3d is over here when this electron is over here then what's going to happen is there's a gap over there and a gap over there remember what i said to you atoms are mainly free space and if that's the case and this atom will core the nucleus will see that nucleus and they'll go oh, oh they're both positively charged and because they're both positively charged they repel they repel each other Okay, so now you guys need to know this graph. You so need to know this graph. You need to be able to draw it. You need to be able to label it. You need to be able to explain it or explain from it. It is like the highlight topic of grade 12, grade 10, grade 11, sorry, grade 11 energy changes during hydrogen bonding, okay? They love asking it, okay? So let's go through it. So what do we have? We have that this is 
the energy. I'm just trying to find my pen. It's gone missing. Oh, no, there it is. The energy. Okay, there's the energy of the pen. And there is the distance between two atomic nuclei. Okay, so I'm going to explain this to you the way I explain this to my students. Okay, so let's pretend that these two atoms over here on the, do it again, over here, okay, are a little person one and person two. And as they see each other across the crowded room, their eyes meet and there's electricity in the air and they fall. They just instantaneously with first eye contact, they fall in love, okay? So what happens is they then move towards each other. They move towards each other. They've been attracted towards each other. Okay, so now they spend time at this party together and everything else, and then they kind of get together, and then they spend all, and you know what it's like when you just start a relationship? What do you do? You spend all your time with each other, whether you're in a relationship or whether you suddenly got a new best friend or whatever, you spend all your time with that person, okay? All your time. But what might happen is you get to a point where you actually you, you are so spending time with each other that you're irritating each other, okay? You can't go and brush your teeth in peace and that person's there and you can't go and pour yourself a cup of coffee and that person's there. So then it gets to the point where you think, okay, that's it. We either need to make some space in a relationship or we're going to break up, okay? In other words, either these two atoms are going to not bond or they're going to get back down to a point where they're at the ideal energy state, they're perfect distance away from each other. They give each other space to brush teeth, make coffee, etc., and they still spend time together. And at that point, there they have bonded. Okay, they've bonded. So that is it. Okay, with respect to the analogy. Now let me explain it to you in science terms. Okay. Okay, so what happens is you get two atomic nuclei that are fairly far between each, fairly far away from each other, okay? Then they happen to move closer to each other. And when they move, become closer to each other, they discover that they are attracted towards each other as per the previous um, diagram, okay? Then what happens is that because atoms are desperately trying to judge, I mean, to join up with other atoms, Okay, they're trying to join up with other atoms to become noble. Okay, so then what's going to happen is they're going to bond. Okay, they bond, yeah. But now what happens? Okay, obviously with bonding there's energy changes and everything and you get to a point where the two atoms totally overlap each other. Okay, they can't see the one bunch of electrons above the other one. They are totally overlaid. Okay. And at this point, like I said, either the atom is going to tell someone that they just, either this atom is going to, sorry, we had a blip, um, break up, okay, they're going to split up apart, or what's going to happen is that this atom is going to lower, it's, it's going to move apart slightly to the point where it is just perfectly bonded, okay? And that's exactly what happens, that because, yeah, there's huge forces of repulsion, as explained over here, where the two nuclei repel each other because they're spending too much time together and the electrons in the wrong place. Okay, so what do we know about this? This means that this year, from year to year, this distance here, that distance, is actually the bond length. Okay, that's the bond length, the length of the bond that makes up this double bonded atom, okay, or single bonded atom. Okay, and this, this point here, okay, is the energy required to break a bond or the energy required to make a bond. So that is the energy required, okay, and you can see it's quite large. Right, so now, you will notice that the energy changes when two helium atoms move close is different from this. This is for hydrogen bonding, and it actually stands for most atomic bonding, okay? Yeah, we've got energy changes when helium moves close together. And please note that helium is one of the noble gases. Obviously, it's a little bit different. It must be, otherwise we wouldn't have something like this. So let's talk about it. Each helium atom has a filled outer energy level, right? It's full. The energy minimum for two helium atoms is very close to zero. Okay, 
The two atoms can come together and move apart easily and never stick together. In other words, yeah, where we said that the atoms stick together because one atom has given lots of labola or energy to the other atom, okay, or electrons. Now, we are saying, yeah, that the energy minimum, the minimum energy required for the two atoms to bond is very close to zero, right. The two atoms come together and move apart easily. There's no sticking, nothing. So now we move on to Lewis diagrams and covalent bonding. Lewis diagrams and covalent bonding. So, sorry, just getting back to this, guys, you need to understand this one. So you need to understand that there is a point where there's a minimum energy required to break the thing, but it says it's very close to zero, okay? So what's happening here is you can see the difference. Yeah, uh, let's go back here. You can see it's a beautiful shape, okay? There's definitely an energy happening here, change happening here, and there's this beautiful thing here. Whereas over here, do you see that nothing happens for a very long time? Why? Because helium is not only a noble gas, but it is... Um, is very small, okay, and because of the fact that it's a noble gas, it's not going to react with each other, okay. So that's what happens. Moving on. Oh. So let's talk Lewis diagrams and covalent bonding. So before we didn't talk about covalent bonding, I mean, okay, we can say the covalent bonding is the transfer of electrons, but before we can really talk about how we go about bonding things covalently, you guys need to understand the Lewis dot diagrams. So you need to make it your mission to make sure you understand them, that you can draw them, etc., etc., etc. So what are Lewis dot diagrams? For those of you who don't know, this is a way of showing how atoms bond to form compounds and we use dots and crosses to indicate the valence electrons of the atoms okay so in other words what we're saying is that we use dots and crosses to indicate the valence electrons we're also saying that you've got a group number is equal to the valence electrons and remember what are the valence electrons is the number of electrons in the outer energy shell so if you look over here, you can see that we've got hydrogens in, okay, so what they've done is they've gone one, two, skip a few, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, okay? So that's easy enough. So this bit here, this gap here, is where you would normally find your transition metals, okay? It's where you normally find your transition metals. Right, so now what are we saying? We're saying in group one, hydrogen has got one valence electron. Beryllium has got two, magnesium has got two, calcium has got two. Group three, we remember it's one, two, skip a few, group three. Group three has got three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so people, if you understand that the group number equals number of valence electrons, then you don't have to go around drawing something like this. You'd go group six, and I'd go, oh, yes, six, right, that is over there, so I need to draw two valence electrons. Okay, that's it. But you need to understand that that's what's happening, okay? Right, so in forming compounds, atoms gain, lose, or share electrons to give a stable electron configuration. And at the moment, we're talking about covalent bonding, so we're talking about the sharing. So now they're saying, let's have a look at this. This is fluorine. We know it's in group seven, right? So how does that work? We've got FF, okay? We go, and then the way it's supposed to go is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right, so that's seven. So now, if you think about that, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, right. So that's seven. And you'll notice that I've drawn mine in crosses over here. There is another seven on the other atom, but it can be in dots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you need to understand that the whole point about this is that if you're drawing your valence electrons, you need to show which electrons belong to which atom. Okay. 
So now this rule is called the octet rule and it is most useful in cases conveying covalent bonds of carbon, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and fluorine. Okay, grade 11s, I think that before we carry on and actually start doing covalent bonding and how bonds form, I think we should stop for the day and we can come back on Thursday and start talking about covalent bonding. Have a great day.